We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners, Burke Britain Financial Partners. Amy did a little pop quiz for us on Instagram before today's podcast, Delta. We thought we might do a quick rapid fire responses to a couple of the questions that, that Amy had asked. So some, some of the responses were quite surprising. So <laughs> They were. What people want to hear about is probably a little bit different to what I'd anticipated, but let's go through them. So we, we did a little this little pop quiz, what people would prefer to hear about. First one was whether people preferred to hear about interest rates or contributing to super. I was sure that the consensus would be people mm. wanting to hear about interest rates, but it was actually contributing to super. Maybe people are a little bit over the interest rate rise. They've just had enough of talking about it. It's been yeah, in front was, of everyone's mind. That was my thoughts, Jay, that they just think, oh, just I don't want to address that anymore. Just park that discussion. So yeah, let's look at other opportunities <laughs> we might have to build our wealth. Obviously, that's generally one portion of our, our wealth. If we've uh, got our home or our investment property, but yeah, perhaps there's more opportunity in looking at something like contributing to super. Maybe it's because it's the end of financial year. We're a week away from the 30th of June. I know that you and I have both been having plenty of conversations with clients, wrapping up some housekeeping prior to 30th of June. I think... We've got a couple of podcasts that we've done previously where we address types of contributions, et cetera, but maybe on contributing to super. We'll talk the end of financial year. We probably won't get this podcast out in time, but let's maybe think for next year. It's really important that you are having a plan in place to actually address your contributions to super before 30 June. A lot of people uh, will get that wrong and they'll get to, you know, Mm. the 1st of July and think, oh, I should have done something. I had the provision to do it, maybe had a tax position that needed to address a contribution to super, but I didn't do it. So positive preemptive planning. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, Jay, proactive. You know, an example I had was with a client who is strictly retired and I touched base with her just to, to check in and see what sort of level of income she earned over the course of the year. And it was uh, surprisingly very high. And then there was a need and opportunity for us to actually try and counteract some of that with a, you know, proactive contribution to super before 30 June. So as you touched on, there's a couple of different ways we can make contributions and types of contributions. And again, dependent on clients' cash flow positions, but the ability for us to immediately make a contribution and then for that to be tax deductible uh, at the closure of the financial year. So... One of the other more topical contribution to super areas that's been the last 12 months in our planning has been the change of contribution eligibility for people beyond age 65 that are not working. So historically, if you're beyond age 65 or 67? 67 for the work test, yeah. Thanks, Delta. That's why you're here. Beyond 67, if you weren't working, you couldn't contribute to super. However, they open up some eligibility for people to be able to do that. If you weren't working, you potentially can contribute to money into super under what they call non-concessional contributions. Mm. Let's not get bogged down in that because this is supposed to be rapid fire. But again, anyone out there is listening to this and thinking, oh, I can't contribute to super, I'm older than 67, mm. maybe there are some some benefits there. And particularly, not only that change of rule, but we're seeing a lot more people talking to us about downsizer contributions to yeah. super as well. So the ability to sell a principal residence based upon some criteria that need to be met and put a chunk of that into super outside of the, the normal contribution caps. Yeah, and not to get too bogged down in technicalities, but it might even be taking some money that you currently have in super temporarily out of super and putting it back in for the estate benefits that that provides. So I would say talk to your advisor. Yeah. How difficult is it to talk rapid fire with some of these topics? <laughs> it's pretty hard. It is. But all right, we're going to jump onto the next one. So the next one was, do people prefer to hear about uh, the best age to retire or buying shares and the share market? This probably didn't surprise me that much. It was fairly uh, dominant focus towards the shares and the share market. Maybe it's just uh, reflective of people on Instagram, maybe hmm. retirement is not really in the the minds of those people thumbing around on Instagram looking at influencers. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I think obviously investing is something that tends to be a focus of, you know, younger clients potentially. But when we talk about investing, investing might be a non-super investment, it might be super, it might be a direct property, it might be a commercial property. So, Isn't it funny, I just thought then the tie in between these two topics about retirement and investing is that there is still a perception that you get to retirement and you stop investing. Yeah, <laughs> that you, absolutely. You get, you get to whatever it be, age yeah. 60 or 65 and you go, oh, that's me, Done, when the reality is you've got the rest of your life yeah. to invest. It could be. And if life expectancy holds true, it's yeah. another 30 years from age 60 that you've got to actually be an investor. So I suppose the point here with shares in the share market, I would say, is that the earlier you can have people thinking about and understanding the benefits of shares in the share market, mm. the better it's going to hold them for the future and even if that's teaching kids this mm. is a bit, little bit of a bugbear for me is making sure yeah, that, that our kids as early as they possibly can start to understand the benefit of compound interest mm. and installments like small amounts regularly over a long period of time whether it be in the share market or managed funds mm. but just giving them some exposure to that so that they're not fearful I, mean, I think we've got a fairly significant portion of the population that is fearful of the share market. They're worried about the share market. It's seen as scary and dangerous when the reality is that in some way, shape or form, most of us have some exposure through the share market. It might be through our superannuation. But if we can start to educate people a little bit more about what the share market is, and again, we did a podcast on this about the different types of investments that you can access and access the share market through, we have people that are much better placed to make informed decisions about their money. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more with, you know, starting early, drip feeding a little bit over a long period of time. That's so important and that's that age-old time in the market, not timing the market. So, yeah, as we've touched on lots of different ways you can be invested. It still sometimes surprises clients when you might look at their existing uh, super fund and you do explain to them that they are invested in the share market via their super and they haven't really appreciated that that is the case. So perhaps we're trying to remove some of the fear sometimes when you, you discuss yeah, the share market in particular. Yeah, I think when you're informed, you become a little less fearful hmm. because you actually you're aware, you know what's going on. You can make some choices and this might actually reflect back on our previous podcast, the one just before this, about people reaching out. If you haven't, like for, it's a, your point there around your super, how many people do we see that have zero idea mm. how their super's invested? They've got a half a million dollars in super and they say they're ultra conservative yeah. and you look at it and there's 90% of it in the share market. Now, it might be right for them, but they're not actually aware of how their money's invested. If you had a half a million dollars or a million dollars invested anywhere, you want to know how it's actually invested. So mm. you could relate that back to property too, Jay. A direct property where you, you know, you you often have hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital tied up in any one property. But sometimes clients will articulate that they feel they're conservative, and you think, okay, well, let's highlight the risks that you're currently taking, and discuss that and inform you a bit more. Yeah. The other thing I'd say before we move on from this one around the share market is, you know, we get the question a lot about where is the share market? Are we at the top? Are we in the middle? Are we at the bottom? And I think what we have always spoken about to our clients is that there's some things that are in our control yep. and there's some things that are out of our control. And you know, we, we can't control what's going on in the US or the UK or some of the larger markets, but what you can control is your own household and your own investments. You can make informed choice about how your funds are invested and you can mitigate against the risk of market fluctuation by paying good attention and getting good advice around how your money's invested and how much you have in the share market versus how much you have in defensive assets. And I think that is a really important note that with our clients, where I can't think of any instance where I would have said to my clients, this is definitely the top of the market and mm. we have to sell 100% of your mm. shares today because I know for sure that it's going to go down tomorrow. Or the flip side, this is definitely the bottom of the market and we need to put all of your money that's in cash into the share market and buy really cheap. We just don't know. Mm. But we have some very good strategies that allow us to take advantage of the ebbs and flows of the market. One of them is the one you mentioned before, which is 
small amounts regularly over a mm. long period of time and mitigating some of those risks and fluctuations of the market. We make it sound easy, Jay. Yeah. Well, to your point, a couple of other, whether it was in this podcast or the previous one, it actually is simple. It's just maybe not easy mm. because you actually have to take the action. Mm. You have to take the action and put a plan in place. You have to have the right people around you. The philosophies are simple. Mm. The action is not necessarily as easy. And that's where you need to get some support. All right, last couple. Would we prefer to hear about Centrelink payments or aged care support? Interestingly, Centrelink payments just on aged care support. Why do you think that is, Delta? I'm not really sure, Jay, but perhaps because there's more of the population that might have some entitlement to, to Centrelink payments. And I suppose just to take a step back for anyone listening and clarify that we do actually provide our clients with Centrelink support. So I think in particular in the age pension space, there's often fear around having to go to Centrelink. And I suppose just yeah, to stress that we do support our clients in that respect. We're a barrier between Centrelink and the clients and we'll do as much as we possibly can to ensure any benefits that they're entitled to, they'll be able to access, including a strategic restructure of assets that might be in place where you've got a couple and so on and any other Centrelink payments that might lead up to being younger than age, pension age. One of the common queries I think we get, and a lot of people in Centrelink terms are, are more informed, I think, than they've been in the past, but a lot of people say, well, I don't think I could actually get mm. a pension. I don't think I'd be eligible. The reality is, and I'm just looking at the asset thresholds, this is one of the, the tests for getting an age pension, Homeowning pension a couple can have nine hundred and fifty four thousand mm. dollars worth of assets excluding their home and still get get some part age pension part age pension mm. and there is also even if people had greater than that, depending upon mm. the couple and their ages and one might be age pension, one might be under age pension, there's certainly some strategies there to potentially look at getting some pension for people that maybe otherwise wouldn't think they're entitled. Mm. I was just going to say that goes back to the, the strategic sort of positioning of, of assets, you know, potentially gifting. There's lots of different ways that we can look at improving, in particular, a couple's situation whereby we might be able to get some part age pension, which of course comes with the age pension concession card, which can be very helpful where potentially we're at a stage of life where things like medications are one of our sort of primary costs yeah. at that point. Maybe on the counter to that note around people desperate to get an age pension, the other thing that I would say is that for those people that sometimes we look at people's situation and their, their desperation to get an age pension maybe blinds them to the fact that they're actually doing okay. <laughs> and that, they can support themselves. Yeah, They've got that, a great pool of capital to access and draw down upon. Yeah. And to try to bend over backwards to change a situation or hide money to uh, get some Centrelink isn't necessarily that advantageous. And if you're in a position where you can comfortably generate the income you need and maintain your capital and you don't get an age pension, you're kind of in a reasonable position. So last pop quiz was would they people prefer to hear more about the Burke Britain team or insurances? Well, it was insurances by a long way. So we won't be offended, will we? We'll nah. talk about us another day. <laughs> I think I think people are sick of sick and tired of hearing about us. They want to hear about their own personal circumstances. So on insurances. I think there's some statistics around insurances that whenever historically when there's been times of crisis, so in times of war time, people's application for insurances actually goes up because mm. people start to question their mortality yeah. and they start to question and think, oh shit, what would happen in the event of, and a lot of people have experienced that over the last few years with COVID, is shit, what happens if my income disappears either yeah. due, to, due to health, due to unemployment or any other factors? How do I actually put a bit of insulation around myself so that my family is going to be okay? Yeah, and look, it would be remiss of us not to address a client's safety net, whether that be formally with insurances or other ways. But if you're building wealth and you're, you know, you've got those investments and things in place, um, your ability to earn an income, it's just so important to protect them on the downside. So we would never not 
ensure that that discussion is at least held with the client. And the flip side to whether it's a direct insurance product, for example, is that not everyone can get insurance. Now, that is becoming more and more common across our new clients that we are finding medical histories and things are perhaps precluding us from getting the insurance that we might require. So it's really important that we run an assessment on what the safety net might look like for your family unit. I think that's probably one of the the least well-known aspects of applying for insurance that people think, I need life insurance. I've decided I need it. I'm going to go and get it and I've got it. When the reality Mm. is that they take into account, this is the insurers, take into account your entire medical history for your entire life and they'll also look at your financial circumstances Mm. and determine whether or not those two things Mm. mean you're eligible to actually get some insurance. And probably the, the big ticket items at the moment in terms of health that really start to become an issue and have precluded people from getting cover or maybe restrict their ability is mental health Mm. so we have a lot of people that are getting mental health exclusions or loadings because of depression anxiety etc potentially because people are talking about it more with their doctors potentially because there's greater incidence of it because there is a lot more stresses in the world and then the other ones that I've seen, a lot of musculoskeletal issues. Like if anyone's had, if you've been to the physio. physio or the chiropractor and you tell your insurers, which you have to when you apply for your cover, be prepared for the fact that there there might be some exclusions or loadings on, on your back. This again is where you need someone in your corner. I've exactly. just had a couple of cases this last couple of weeks where insurers' first response to us is, no, you can't have that cover because of... Uh, mental health or musculoskeletal issues but with some negotiation and some conversations with the underwriters and maybe some additional reports from medical practitioners we've been able to get those policies and that insurance that's required through so again another reason i'm sort of tooting our own horn here delta (laughs) and advocating for people getting support getting advice on all the things that we're talking about yeah i think jay the the point there is that we do our absolute best to support our clients so we go into bat for them and whether that be with the insurers or in looking at other options if insurance is not available to us yeah we'll do our very best to make sure that their safety net is in place beautiful well We did manage to keep it under 20 minutes, Amy. We've wrapped. So uh, thanks for joining me again, Delta. And I look forward to another conversation real soon. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility. Do your homework. Ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading as Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.